Oh, hello, everyone. Happy Thursday. It's really nice to see you all. Thank you for joining us. I know the time was a little bit unusual, um, but we really appreciate you making the time to hang out. Um, today is yet another Thursday, which means I have the privilege of discussing with one of our team members. Um, and today, that day, um, the stage is shared with my dear friend Ashutosh, who uh, you all likely know from uh, his impact on VMR. I still remember the explosive onset of uh, his presence with a case that uh, still befuddles me today, a case of a condition I'd never heard of called rupus. Um, but since then, Ashutosh has become a pillar of CP solvers and been so intimately involved in many, many things. And I only recently learned uh, about his uh, IT skills, um, which actually I should, I don't want to embarrass myself by saying too much more, but I know he's working with Francisco and others on some fancy smancy uh, things that I don't really understand. Um, but Ashutosh, it's been a treat to share this space with you for so long now, almost, not quite a year, but almost a year. Um, and excited to celebrate that um, by discussing a case with you today. Um, Ashutosh, I'll pass the mic for you to say hi, and then uh, uh, we'll pivot to the case. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ravi. Thanks for the introduction. I mean, I think, uh, of course, that's uh, that's uh, th that was quite an exaggerated session, I would say. Um, I mean, I am interested in IT, but not like, <laughs> uh, not to the level <laughs> uh, that you uh, that you mentioned. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Ashutosh. I'm originally from Nepal. I have been a CP Solvers Academy member for almost a year now. I think in a month I will have my anniversary <laughs> with CP Solvers. Um, uh, as usual, I loved the time uh, learning with you all and from the team members and super excited for today's case to go discuss with Ravi. We all are too, my friend. Um... I, I want to uh, open it up to everybody. We um, we had a, a scheduled case presenter who doesn't look like they're able to make it. We haven't heard from them. So I um, uh, we ha we have some things up our sleeves, but I wanted to open the uh, uh, open the floor for um, any of our guests. If you all are holding on to a case or have a case you're interested in, um, I'll give it uh, a few moments in the chat. It really can be uh, a case of anything. A urinary tract infection, uh, a cellulitis, uh, an influenza. I'm counting to 30 in my head, by the way. It takes much longer than you think. Feels... Uh, endlessly long. Deborah, we made it to 30. I'm gonna lean on you. Did you find anything in your file or you need some more time? Continue talking and I'm looking. What are you gonna do today, Ashdash? <laughs> Deborah has a deep trove of cases from the past. Um, uh, that she's looking through to help us find a case to discuss today. Um, in the meantime, I'll pass the mic to our other contributors, which we usually celebrate at the end, but we'll celebrate now. Uh, Francisco, you're scribing today. You want to say hi? Oh, wait. Francisco, you should say hi, and then Parisa should say hi. And then we have a gift from the crowd, Deborah. From not the crowd, from the menu. Oh, my gosh, I'm so excited. <laughs> Uh, Francisco and Parisa, you all should say hi, and then we'll uh, pivot to Mengu to uh, to uh, present a case. I'll start with you, Francisco. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here, and one more time, scribing uh, also uh, with my dear friends, uh, Rabi, Ash, uh, and Parisa. So it's going to be a great case. Uh, thank you, Mengu. We, we are excited to, to hear what you have, and uh, let's go. Hello, everyone. My name is Parisa. Happy to be here, and I am doing Teaching Point today. Amazing. All right. Mengu, the mic is yours. Yeah. Um, I'm frantically uh, turning on my computer so I can make sure I have all the details of the case. Oh, you're the best. Um, Thank you. <laughs> but just, yeah, let me, I should find it in a minute. Um, 
Okay. Overall, take your time. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I have a 71 year old man uh, who is presenting with a left ear pain hmm. uh, and uh, right leg swelling. Oh my gosh. Uh, I should tell you. I'm really, uh, to give maybe a little bit of time to put everything together, I think this is quite the chief concern. I'm really curious, if you're imagining standing in front of this patient or ideally sitting um, by them, um, I'm curious, what would be running through your mind if you heard left ear pain and right leg swelling? Uh, yeah, uh, this looks like a very interesting um, set of uh, complaint um, because it's like a unilateral leg swelling. And when it comes to unilateral leg swelling, I think uh, uh, um, uh, the differential is very different from the bilateral leg swellings, which usually involves uh, pathologies of uh, uh, organs like heart, liver, uh, and kidneys in case of bilateral leg swelling. Here we have unilateral leg swelling. And when, when I think of that, I usually think of uh, uh, inflammation or, or infection, which is uh, confined to uh, one of the lower extremities. Um, I am not very sure how to, uh, how to think of uh, uh, like uh, with this combined set of complaints, like with ear pain and uh, right leg swelling uh, right now. But uh, uh, given the unilateral nature of the leg swelling, I would be thinking about uh, cellulitis or DVT uh, for, for the lower extremity swelling. Um, uh, and yeah, I, I think that's what I'm thinking right now. I would love to learn more from you. Well, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, if you take this at face value, and I think um, the reason you probably wouldn't is you'd wonder, are we missing something? And the reason I think we'd wonder is, are you missing something is exactly what you said. Um, right, a unilateral lower extremity edema is much more often a disease that is local, a local infection, a local blood clot. And disease of the left ear is often a local disease, otitis externa, uh, uh, otitis media, a foreign body in the ear. So here you have the tension of the fact that left ear disease often reflects something local, a right leg issue often reflects something local, yet their synchronous appearance um, might make you wonder that they are linked in some way, shape, or form. Overwhelmingly, uh, well, one of my, one of my uh, mentors has this rule that if the patient has a chief concern about things that are more than three feet apart, then they're probably unrelated. And I think the, the three foot rule definitely applies here. And so I think in real life, you would almost certainly be uh, uh, um, evaluating these things uh, separately. But um, because the patient is linking them together, open to some unusual manifestation of these conditions that bridges them. Uh, if we were to focus on the less, less uh, uh, familiar thing, at least in VMR, um, when you've either thought about ear pain or, um, or, um, or seen it in real life, and you just start with that and focus on that. What is your experience of dissecting and breaking that down? Uh, thinking of ear pain, I uh, usually start uh, with the anatomical approach, like uh, what uh, what can cause uh, ear pain starting from the external auditory canal. Pathologies of external auditory canal starting from something as simple as like uh, wax impaction to uh, to uh, otitis, uh, otitis externa, or even go going deeper into the anatomy of the ear, and in that uh, for like including conditions that involves the middle ear, such as otitis media and uh, middle ear infections, and uh, mm, maybe uh, maybe certain viral infections that could also uh, involve uh, uh, inner ear. So that is something I think of other, other than infections. I think uh, trauma could be one thing that can cause ear pain. And because I was recently traveling, the later initially I didn't have this thought, but later on I was thinking like if this person was have has have was traveling uh, in an in an airplane for a long time, he might get uh, barrel trauma from like all in the ear and might also get a DVT, which could present this way. So um yeah that's that's basically what i'm thinking right now mm. 
Mm. Oh, we can't hear you, Robbie. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you, Francisco. Sorry, I had saw my mute button press for some reason. Yeah, I completely agree with you. That was a really nice synthesis of how they could be related. It, it seemed like you thought of that in the moment, which was really cool. But yeah, I think if you apply the approach to ear pain, it really is um, helpful to have it anatomic in large part because you have access to the ear and visualize both the external and internal compartments. And I will tell you the two most common causes by far are otitis externa and uh, a foreign body in the ear. That's because otitis media gets less and less common after the teenage years and is exceedingly rare in adults. Um, so um, the approach to ear pain is really, uh, and actually initially saying, is the exam suggestive of the cause? Do you see something that allows you to say, oh, that's the cause of the pain? Um, there's a whole category of referred pain to the ear, which uh, reflects dental disease or cervical disease. But the first step, as you said, is anatomic with using your eyes. And if your eyes don't tell you what's going on, then you may have to think about referred ear pain. Awesome, John. All right, thank you. Thank you again for jumping in last minute and for a really, really intriguing chief concern. Uh, what do you have next? Yeah, wonderful discussions. Um, uh, awesome. So, uh... Uh, next, uh, aliquot is HPI. So the patient had a left ear pain for since two months ago, associated with hearing loss in the left ear, uh, but no report, no fevers or chills. Uh, he went to urgent care a month ago where uh, they placed an auto wick uh, and he was prescribed Ciprodex, which is a Ciprodexamethone eardrop. Um, the auto wick came out after five days. So he returned to the urgent care because no improvement and he was pres prescribed auto augmenting for seven days without improvement. Um, also, like he reported the right-sided lower extremity swelling starting uh, started a, a week ago. Um, on review of system, he had some exertional, endorses some exertional, uh, so breast for the past year, with some occasional dry cough, but otherwise no chest pain, fever, chills, or uh, weight loss. I think I'll... Yeah. I can finish the past medical history part as well, hmm. uh, which is, I think, not very remarkable. Actually, he has hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, prior stroke two years ago, but no significance to Quilla. He takes no meds, no allergy. Uh, he smoked uh, one pack per day for 50 years, but quit it two years ago. No alcohol or drug use and uh, no significant family history. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Um, thank you so much, Megu. Uh, Ashutosh, I'm really curious. Um, when if we just focus for a moment on the on the ear stuff, um, what journey did your mind make as you started to hear these the this information? Um, yeah, the, uh, this patient has been having ear pain. Uh, ear pain was in fact proceeding. Um, Mm -hmm. And then the leg pain, uh, and then the leg swelling developed. So uh, I'm 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 trying to think of uh, I'm trying to think of conditions which can maybe do a present in the similar way. Uh, but I'll be very honest that I'm uh, not uh, I don't have a clear thought in my mind. Yeah. Um, I think uh, because there was hearing loss as well, and uh, along with the ear pain, uh, which did not respond to the antibiotics um uh i'm 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 wondering if this could be i mean this could, this could definitely be infection or something else as well i uh, i was thinking if uh, if if this could be something serious or like uh, uh like the like the zoster virus infection which nice. which can, can maybe cause similar kind of situation uh but uh, i don't think i hard, have a very right? clear idea in my head yeah right it's now. hard i'm really i appreciate that you're acknowledging that this is an unusual story and it's not giving you a clear pathway um, of what's going on and i completely agree with that and i appreciate you vocalizing it and the question now is how can we take advantage of what has been done to help us get a little bit more clarity and ashutosh i think you're seeing your your prior conversation bearing out, which is the patient came in with ear pain. And what did the people do? They treated him for the most common cause of ear pain in adults, which is otitis externa. And that's the WIC. The WIC is a 
basically a small device that they put in the ear that opens up the ear canal that allows drainage. Because otherwise, if you have really severe otitis externa, the ear canal can shut and you can no longer drain the ear. So a wick is essentially a place to open up the ear and allow the infusion, not the infusion, but the arrival of antibiotics through the ear. So you can see that that base rate is applying. Now, I have a fun question for you. You see that the patient got ciprofloxacin drops, ciprofloxacin. Do you or anyone here, say this in the chat, know why you have to use uh, an antibiotic like ciprofloxacin for otitis externa, not uh, Augmentin or, uh, or Bactrim? There's something really important about the ciprofloxacin. Anyone have an idea? Have you, Ashutosh, have you uh, came, come across this? Uh huh. Yeah, I think uh, if if I'm if I'm correct, I think otitis externa can be caused by pseudomonas, which yeah. is that we give needs to cover it. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Now the question is, why pseudomonas? We don't give pseudomonas treatment for other infections on the surface of the body. Why do we have to think about pseudomonas in all otitis externa? This is a tough one. It's a really good learning point. We don't cover pseudomonal cellulitis, right? We don't cover pseudomonas keratitis. Why? The ear. So Ashdos, let's talk about this. How do people get otitis externa? Do you know, like what has to happen for them to get an infection in their outer ear? Um, so basically like outer ear has its own way of uh, preventing infection, which is yeah. slip played by, uh, the role is played by the wax or sediment, yep. what we call yeah. it. So yep. what, in situation which in which that gets washed out, like somebody who is a swimmer or yeah, uh, it, uh, I mean uh, the wax is not able to clear off the infection and uh, increases the risk of those infection. And I think if uh, uh, pseudomonas uh, can also be contacted from like water resources, so exactly. maybe this is why we cover it. Exactly, exactly right. The major risk factor for getting an infection in your ear is water exposure. Where does pseudomonas live? Oof, uh, uh, in the soil and the water. And so that's why you really, really have to treat it. There's only one other instance where a superficial infection uh, needs treatment for pseudomonas. Um, and I'll share that with you guys at the end. It has nothing to do with the ear. But here you have to think when somebody has an ear infection, your antibiotic choices are very skewed towards thinking about waterborne organisms, especially pseudomonas. And so even if somebody has really severe um, uh, 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 infections in this area, pseudomonal coverage is really, really important, unlike its importance in, in, in uh, other uh, non-hospitalized patients. So that was really cool to see that. Um, it's very unusual for otitis externa not to improve ashtos. I think that's very, very unusual. And that's why I think you're a little worried that um, there, there might be something systemic going on. And I think, honestly, what I would do now is to really realize that um, this is now painting a picture of a, of a more sinister process because the patient isn't improving. And so now I think, Ashutosh, we have to think about the fact that the patient also has other symptoms. He has right leg swelling and exertional dyspnea and a dry cough. And I'm curious if we focus on the, on the respiratory dimension for a second. Um, where is your head? How are you thinking about the exertional dyspnea and the dry cough? Um, uh, I think, uh, probably, uh, because it was mentioned in review of system, I'm assuming that this was, uh, uh, uh chronic in nature. So, uh, when I think of, uh, exer like, exertional dyspnea, which is most likely chronic in nature, uh, it can be caused due to any lung pathologies or any heart, con any of heart conditions and, uh, uh, it can be also caused due to anemia, due to like poor oxygen delivery. I'm wondering if this patient had this and uh, which could cause it. And uh, uh, lung pathologies will, would include anything from interstitial lung disease mm -hmm. to like COPDs, uh, COPDs, and especially given the fact that patient has a dry cough, I think uh, uh, I would also uh, I would also consider uh, heart conditions like heart failure. Uh, which could which could potentially cause uh, mm, exertional dyspnea uh, together with dry cough. Uh, so yeah, that's where my thought is. Superb. Yeah, I think uh, I think that analysis is really really powerful. 
um, you took exertional dyspnea, you realized that because it be because it's showing up on review of systems, it's probably something slowly progressive as opposed to something that the patient leads with. And I think it's really interesting to ask yourself how the dry cough helps you. And I think in the instance of um, in the in the instance of dyspnea alone, a dry cough can be either a lung problem or as you said, coughing because there's fluid in your lungs from the heart like heart failure. But the very interesting thing about heart failure, when it causes buildup of fluid in your lungs to the point where you're coughing, then most patients' dyspnea will not just be exertional, but will also be present at rest. So there's a little bit of a disconnect between the severity of the dyspnea, which is that it's not severe enough to be present at rest, and the severity of the cough, which is present no matter what. And the ratio of the prominence of the cough to the relatively underwhelming nature of the dyspnea, which requires exertion to manifest, is much more in keeping with an intrinsic lung issue than would be expected for the heart because the heart should cause synchronous, proportional dyspnea and cough. And so for me, I'm uh, not closing the door on heart diseases, but I'm appreciating the fact that the dry cough is there, full stop, but the dyspnea is only exertional, suggesting that there's true intrinsic lung disease um, rather than heart. But, you know, we have swelling, maybe the subtle swelling on the left side, the patient doesn't appreciate, and that may change uh, our calculus, but that's where I'm at. Um, so Ashutosh, I think your instincts are playing out. We'll have to look at the ear and we'll have to look at the cardiopulmonary apparatus and then, of course, a first concern about the leg will be, is there a clot, as you mentioned earlier? But uh, why don't we get an exam and whatever other data that you has to see how we can make progress? Yeah, wonderful discussion. So I'll go to the exam. Um, uh, patient is uh, well-developed, no acute distress. Uh, he has, uh, for the ear, he has decreased hearing of the left ear with swelling and tenderness. Uh, there was some yellow drainage in the external canal, uh, in the os of the external canal, and the uh, the external outer canal is severely swollen uh, with no visible lumen, given how swollen it is, and uh, there's uh, some mastoid tenderness. Uh, right ear is normal, chest, abdomen exams are norm were normal. Uh, his extremities on the right side has uh, uh, swelling and pain, uh, uh, pain with dorsiflexion, um, uh, worsen with dorsiflexion as well. Neuro exam is otherwise normal. Mm, maybe I'll just briefly pause here, see if you have any reflections before moving on to the labs. Thank you so much, Mingyu. Yeah, Ashutosh, what did you think of the, yeah, the ear findings? Uh, yeah, I think uh, the, the lumen is not visible and uh, there's a drainage coming out of the external uh, external canal with, along with the mastoid tenderness. Mm. So uh, this makes me think, uh, this makes me think, uh, of course, the possibility of uh, otitis externa, I don't, I don't think I can uh, rule it out yet. I yeah. think uh, that still be the case. Uh, but given this patient also has a mastoid tenderness, mm -hmm. uh, I'm also thinking of something like whether something like cholesteatoma or mm -hmm. the, that sort of thing may have uh, caused this patient's um, ear pain uh, and that presentation, especially focusing on the ear side. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking at the leg, I think like with, with, there is a pain with the dorsiflexion. So that is... Uh, that 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 makes me think again about the DVD. Whether whether this this patient has a DVD, uh, there uh, there may there may be other conditions as well in which the similar finding can be seen. Uh, one thing that I can remember right now is I think uh, compartment syndrome can cause it, but I 
do not see any uh, other uh, any other um, situation or as any other findings that could lead uh, to that diagnosis in this particular case. Uh, yeah, those are my thoughts regarding the exam findings. Excellent. I completely agree with you. I think when you look at the right leg and you see it's swollen, there are two leading things we think about all the time with a swollen leg initially. And that's, is it infected or is it clotted off? And I, again, another helpful ratio helps you here is in most cellulitis infection, you'll see a lot more erythema than you will see edema. In the DVT, the edema usually is much more prominent than the erythema. And here, with the fact that there is swelling without redness or prominent redness, again, heightens the concern for deep vein thrombosis for sure. What's more intriguing, I think, is because you know what you're going to do with the leg. You need an ultrasound. There's no way out of that. What's really intriguing is to think about the ear. And I think it was only um, until after residency that I really understood the distinction between otitis externa and malignant otitis externa. These two terms are really, really fundamentally different, but we, we know them and are familiar with them in a different space. Otitis externa is the ear equivalent of cellulitis. Malignant otitis externa is the ear equivalent of necrotizing fasciitis, where the idea is the infection has evaded and extended beyond the surface, i.e. the ear canal, and has gone deeper to compromise the subcutaneous and even uh, bony structures, including the mastoid. So in this context, I think the first and most important consideration would be to wonder about the possibility of malignant otitis externa, which is strongly linked with diabetes, but not dependent on that link. And so in this patient, I think imaging of their ear with a CT scan is gonna be more, uh, uh, more important than it would be otherwise. When an ear looks this bad, the priority is to think about the most serious complication, which is necrotizing infection, i.e. malignant otitis externa. However, there are many other things that cause the ear to swell um, and cause the mastoid to be tender. So we have to prioritize a really bad infection, but not lock that in because the overlap of infection and deep vein thrombosis is minimal. Whenever you're thinking inflammation and clot, you, we often think cancer, cancer, cancer. The link between uh, an uh, autoimmune disease and clot is weaker than it is with cancer, but stronger than it is with infection. So if we're making a table right now of clot, presumed clot and inflammation, cancer, 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 then autoimmune disease and then infection. So here, I think morbidity would push us to think about this as malignant otitis externa. But you would have to wonder, hmm, the overlap of infection on thrombosis is not as strong as it is with cancer, and it's not as strong as it is with autoimmune disease. Um, so those would be, I think, the, the tension points that I would have. Did any questions come up for you, Ashutosh, or any other thoughts that you wanted to share uh, since I blabbered for a little while? Uh, uh, I think uh, I, I really like that uh, thing that you just mentioned about like DVT and infection uh, when the when there's a clot problem or an infectious problem together, it's more likely that it's uh, it's a malignancy. Uh, and given the patient has like exertional dyspnea and dry cough, I was I was thinking whether whether the patient has is whether the patient has some kind of lung cancer or not, mm -hmm. uh, because there was a smoking history, although the patient has quit it, and yeah. the patient's age also supports, like, see, he, he is 71 years old. I wouldn't be surprised uh, regarding the age part if this turns out to be the case. Uh, and I, I, I really like that, the, 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 the link between the two things. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think it's, uh, we'll have to explore it for sure. Um, yeah, all right, let's see where we go. Uh, Mengi, what do you have next for us? Yeah, awesome discussion. Um, now get ready for the laps. <laughs> so white count <laughs> is uh, 173. Normal is less than 10, so uh, 173. And then hemoglobin 10.5, uh, platelet uh, 216, uh, like normal. Um, the uh, uh, ultimate, so the differential, so automated differential, from the you know the lab automation machine is um the 
uh, uh, I think lymphocyte is uh, 125 to, uh, yeah, and monocyte is 34, uh, ne uh, neutrophil 11, uh, 11, and eosinophil 1, and basal 0 0.9. Uh, it automa automatically reads as, as many atypical lymphocytes, um, smart cells present. Uh, uh, eight months ago, the, there's a baseline CBC. Uh, it was, uh, there were, uh, all three cell lines are normal, um, like um, WBC7, hemoglobin 12.9, platelet 183, and the differential um, uh, was uh well actually I'll, I'll I'll skip that part and then B um other other labs we have a basic metabolic panel sodium is one thirty seven, uh, uh potassium three point nine bicarb twenty three yeah basically normal and then creatinine is one point five six, um, BUN twenty one calcium eight point five, uh, uh LDH seven eighteen ESR fifty nine and CRP sixty Three. Uh, I'll also give you the the imaging. I think uh, since we kind of talked about that, uh, we kind of asked for it in the last eloquent as well. So CT maxillo facial uh, is uh, reported as necrotizing left otitis externa and bilateral otitis media with mastoid effusion. Uh, ENT was consulted in the ED and recommended placing a, a wick. Uh, the drainage to drain it and start cipro eardrops, um, and as well as IV uh, ciprofloxacin. Oh my um, gosh! Wow, Ashutosh, were you expecting that? A white count of one hundred seventy-three thousand. I want to oh, be able to give you. Old. I know, right? I want to give you a little bit more time to think about this. I think it's a really good opportunity since we have a little bit of a smaller group here to do some breakout rooms. So uh, I'm going to pause the recording. All right, welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a good time. Ashutosh, I could see that you were you could combine your brain power with Jack. What did, what did you guys talk about? Uh, yeah, we were we were talking about like uh, like I said initially. I was uh, when you uh, when you mentioned about how infection and clot could be related to malignancy, uh, and given the smoking history, I was thinking whether the shortness of breath is because of that. But the white count, I wasn't expecting that that white count. <laughs> And uh, now after seeing the white count, I'm wondering if there's like a hematological malignancy going on, which is uh, causing some sort of immunosuppression for the patient and increasing the risk of uh, uh, malignant uh, uh, otitis externa. At the same time, if uh, malignancy itself can increase the risk of DVT and cause the leg swelling. Uh, and the other thing with such a high white count, I think, uh, a condition where like a bunch of white cells get clogged up in the blood vessels. Excellent. That could be a case as well. So uh, mm, yeah. that's that's yeah that's that's what we discussed and that's what where my, where my thought is. Superb, superb. You don't need me here at all. I'm curious since you were since you absolutely hit a home run with that, um, or since you like cricket, you hit a six with that. I will say. Um, let me ask you this. What do you think about Mengu's harder question about triage? Would you accept this patient to your service if you are working at a low resource facility or do you think they need to be transferred somewhere else? That's an impossible question to know for sure, but what are your instincts on that? Um, I think um, this, per this patient will definitely need, need a heme consult for sure. Uh, and I think my first priority would be uh, would be to uh, would be to stabilize the patient, even mm -hmm. if I am uh, transferring the patient. So in that case, uh, if if let's say the the leg swelling is indeed a, a DVD, yeah. I would not want to uh, I mean delay or cause complications because of that. Or the patient's dyspnea, if it's it's because of a pulmonary embolism, I would definitely like to work up more and get gather more information before transferring. Uh, but finally, I think I would end up uh, transferring the patients, especially for the heme yeah. consult. Yeah, 100%. I, I, I think you're you're uh, really thinking about something very wise here. And I, I just want to get your sense. Uh, maybe, Francisco, I think I stole your sharing uh, ability with the breakout rooms. There we go. Thank you so much, my friend. Do you, uh, Ashutosh, so let's, you, you, we have to analyze this case in more detail. Um, and so now the question for you is, 
you said hematological malignancy, and the only progress or the only clue we have so far is the differential. And the differential says uh, lymph, um, really lymphocyte and monocyte predominant. So how much juice are you able to get out of that information? That is lymphocyte and monocyte predominant. What do you think? Mm -hmm. uh, the lineage of these two cells are definitely uh, different from, uh, I mean, it's not, it, they do not come from the same hematopoietic, I mean, the, the mother hematopoietic stem cells is obviously the same, but down the line, it's, it's, it's a different lineage. Uh, but uh, to be very honest, uh, what could exactly be the case yeah. here? I, I'm not being able to picturize the whole thing properly. No, no problem at all. So that's whenever you're there, my advice to you and all of you is to step back and just ask yourself in your own head, what do I know about causes of lymphocytosis and remove all the other data? Because the, all the other data makes you too narrow. So Ashtos, in general, when you see lymphocytosis full stop, nothing else, no other information, what thoughts cross your mind? Uh, the the differentials that would come in my mind, yeah. I think it would be leukemoid reaction and uh, uh, he, like uh, hematological malignancies, including uh, leukemias, like chronic lymphocytic leukemias Excellent. and uh, uh, myelogenous leukemias and lymphomas, uh, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphomas as well. Uh, yeah, base, yeah, that's those Super. those those are the things that we'll be thinking. Super. Excellent. Um... Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to uh, pause the recording because I would love to show you a schema uh, on uh, rlrcpsolvers.com uh, because I think it's really, really important um, to be able to understand this space. <laughs> Thank you, Francisco. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, the summary of that conversation, Ashutosh, is whenever you see lymphocytes, time course is really helpful, acute or subacute. Subacute lymphocytosis is a lymphoma until proven otherwise. Acute lymphocytosis requires assessment for mononucleosis and drug-induced disease, but the priority is to make sure that the automated reviewer is not mistaking blasts and thinking that those blasts are lymphocytes. And given the height of the white count, the acuity of it, and the marked immunocompromise, it's looking a lot like Parisa's case where she presented a patient with acute leukemia who had zoster as their infection. And maybe here, the otitis externa is the infection here. But I would be uh, requesting a stat hematological assessment for the possibility of an acute leukemia, but open to the possibility this is an acute lymphoma. Uh, any questions about that, Ashutosh? Um, I, th and I think, yeah. Uh... So the subacute, if 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 it's a subacute, yeah. I'm just I was just like to like uh, go through that uh, for a moment. If it's yeah. a subacute, we should think of lymphoma, yeah. uh, lymphoma, and if if it's very acute, we uh, we should not like. If there is a chance that the analyzer, that the machine that we are using, is mistaking uh, the uh, the blast cell as a lymphocyte, right? And in this situation, maybe the patient might have might be having some sort of leukemia which is producing that many blast cell and which is uh, which is like misread as a lymphocyte of that many high count, right? Another six, my friend. <laughs> For those of you who have no idea what cricket is, I should do us, uh, that refers to basically a home run. A really nice job, my friend. That was awesome. Great song. All right, thank you. What do you have in store for us next? Yeah, uh, so exactly. We consulted hema uh, hematologist. It's like a virtual consult. I don't think he's available in the hospital at that time. But uh, uh, in the meantime, we got a DVT ultrasound confirmed. There's a DVT in the right leg. So um, when we call hematologist, I think he was a little perplexed by the differential. And uh, he thought, well, maybe this is CLL um, that. Um, so he's up. He thought it's okay to admit the patient, and um, he recommends uh, just follow up on the labs and monitoring. And patient might need IVIG, which I think, if like there's like infection in the setting of CRL, sometimes you think about uh, immunoglobulin deficiency, things like that. Um, uh, and but exactly as what Ravi said, the next the next morning, uh, the lab kind of reverted its reading. <laughs> like it now reads as. Uh, 
only uh eight percent lymphocytes but 71 percent blasts and um a monocyte uh of 13 percent. but yeah uh, i think what, what's mostly really jumping out is the pathology part is now available and saying it's like uh there are a lot of blasts um and not actually not that much lymphocytes um and uh it um so the patient at this time uh because our initial thought was like cll you could have like a very high white count, but not necessarily worries you that much, uh, like causing, uh, you know, leukostasis or uh, complicating with CVT. But for a for a um something else like AML, then it it would be like a emergency that really needs to be transferred to like starting chemo as soon as possible. Um, so our our initial concern was to the, the need to transfer patient for leukostasis. Um, but um. The patient at this point, you know, the concern with the change in the in the actual reading of the CBC differential, um, hematologist recommends starting hydroxyurea to stabilize the count, and uh, uh, and then the patient at this time, uh, like in a few days after waiting for a few days on hydroxyurea, um, was tra then transferred to the the like uh, oncology the center BMT service. Um, and, um, and, uh, yeah, I think, yeah. So as mentioned earlier, I think the peripheral smear shows actually, actually 90% probable, probable blasts. Uh, and they also did a flow cytometry that came back as, uh, uh, well, there's a bunch of immunophenotype studies. Uh, basically they, uh, the majority of blasts are my myeloid and are, are favored to show monocytic differentiation and a small a, a small minority showing expression of various B lineage markers. Um, wow! So it's like a mixed kind mm -hmm. of uh, mixed phenotype acute leukemia with B and myeloid or monocytic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is an unbelievable case. It's so educational. Um, just wanted to stop here for a moment and then pass the mic to you in a second to just see, um, really try to see what questions are. I, I just think it's so crucial that that point that we were making in the last Aquad is crystal clear because it could be life-saving for people. So Ashutosh, I'm really curious, where is, um, wh where is your head at and what is your understanding of this case so far? How are you putting it together? Uh, I mean, this was an amazing case. Uh, initially, uh, I, I I was not like very a, a very much clear in how to uh, think of those two chief complaints, uh, and uh, turns out there is a link indeed. Uh, <laughs> so um, I am still I was still thinking in the moment when you asked me this question, I was thinking what was possibly the cause of exertional dyspnea in this case. Uh, which I'm not sure I'm very clear right now as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and uh, mm, the case is very, very interesting and very educational in terms of uh, uh, in, in in terms of how two different uh, chief complaint can have a can, can relate to one uh, one pathology as its root cause. Uh, so um, and which which highlights the importance of uh, being very uh, holistic with the with all our approach and uh, uh, so that so that we can arrive at the diagnosis. Uh, that's that's what I'm in fact thinking. Yeah. yeah, I would I would love to I'd love to like know what what could potentially be the cause of uh, exertional dyspnea and dry dry cough in this case. Is it yeah. the cells? Is it because of the the neoplastic cells mm -hmm. or something else? Great question. So I think you know if we just replay the tape again. Um, mm -hmm. And you go back and you're like, you have left uh, ear pain and swelling and you have a right leg swelling. And you you take that and you said, remember that we were like, whenever you have a DD, whenever you're worried about thrombosis, you should uh, tweak your uh, prioritization of the cause of inflammation uh, uh, to prioritize malignancy. And you can see how when you get the diff of the C back, you're like, whoa. <laughs> That, that hypothesis is bearing fruit. The single most important fact is lymphocytosis, acute 
chronic. Acute lymphocytosis is acute leukemia until proven otherwise. Chronic lymphocytosis is lymphoma until proven otherwise. How can acute leukemia show up as lymphocytosis? It's because there is a error in how the machine that does the CBC reviews that and accidentally labels blasts as lymphocytes owing to their visual similarity. This is a software issue. And when the pathologist uses their eyes, they're like, oh my gosh, this is blasts. This, I've seen this many times now. Not I've seen it directly once, but heard many cases. So this is a machine mistake, nothing else. Now, what are your clues that it's a machine mistake is one, the acuity of the disease. And here's the other one. What is happening in the ear is of debate. Is it an infection or is it monocytic infiltration of the ear? So um, whenever you, you may have seen the step one, step two, or step three question of gum hyperplasia from a MML, that infiltration can happen anywhere into the ear, into the gums, and into the lungs. So uh, what are my thoughts about the exertional dyspnea and dry cough? It could be leukostasis, or it could be a monocytic infiltration in the lungs, of which you know only a CT scan would be able to really tell you. But here, the ear pain may not be infectious at all, but maybe monocytic uh, infiltration. Um, so I think the most important thing to emphasize here is just how acute lymphocytosis is mistaken leukemia, uh, until proven otherwise. Thank you. What was it? I, I don't know if you have more data on what, uh, what happened to the patient or anything else. And I'm curious what your reflections and, and learning was from this case. Really good one. Yeah. Just to echoing with what you said about the year, there's one last piece of information is that due to the lack of improvement, the team, uh, did a biopsy of the 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 ear um and confirmed there is um uh the blast uh there's infiltration of the leukemia cells with blasts and uh, uh consistent with the uh, uh leukemia identified in the in the blood yeah i think the patient i think the outcome wise um patient had a i think he is split three positive and so he was started on some complex chemotherapy given some mixed lineage and he didn't do very well. I think it's a kind of refractory disease. So I have yet to follow up eventually how he did, but yeah, it was a very difficult to treat leukemia uh, type he has. Uh, yeah, in terms of reflection, uh, I think that this is a really good case. Uh, also for for me, especially the part where um, the, the flipping of the reading with the automated automated uh, pathology, and I also later, uh, shortly after uh, seeing this case, I I saw the schema about how the um, blasts are often mistakenly read as lymphocytes, and I was like, wow, <laughs> making me reflecting on the case and the initial management. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for walking walking through Anshutosh and Ravi. This is like amazing discussions. I learned again so much from your discussions. I can't believe you jumped in to present this case last minute. We're so appreciative of you doing that. It really is telling of the person you are. We really admire that a lot. And uh, your reflections on on the uh, the challenges in the moment and also like the reading thereafter is just so symbolic of what we're all about, you know, which is really cool. Thank you so much, Mangi. Ashutosh, how did it feel to discuss? First time? At least first time. Yeah. It was super, I mean, I was, I was definitely super excited and then nervous at the same time. Uh, I think the case was so educational and it taught me a couple of, uh, a lot of things. And uh, um, so, which made, I, I didn't even realize how quickly the time passed, uh, probably because how interesting and how educational the case was and the how well you taught and every uh, everyone was so active with their comments in the chats and everything. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, I can't believe it's already past the hour like you I said I enjoyed every dimension that you you enjoyed too but also just enjoyed seeing how comfortable you were sharing your thinking about things that um, we don't talk about on VMR much left ear pain uh, as an example DVT as another example combining these things as an example but I think what I appreciate most is just your, your when you said you know what I don't know what to do with this I'm not sure what this means and your um, desire to learn and then how how uh, effortlessly you remembered and how flawlessly you remembered what you were taught, which was really, really cool. Um, so massive, massive kudos to you. Um, I just wanted to emphasize to everybody listening um, how cool it is to uh, share the stage with Mengyu and Ashutosh. And I really encourage all of you, just like Mengyu today, to think about uh, presenting your case. Uh, we really, really lean heavily on that. And so the process is very, very similar. I realize I haven't shown it in a while um on on youtube so i would just love to show you really quickly um if you go sorry francisco one more time <laughs> if you go to clinicalproblemsolving.com which is our main uh, website uh yusuf noah and many others who have worked on the website have made it uh and huiting have made it um simple you just click on morning report and you go right here you end up here and then you click, click this, present a case, and, and it basically walks you through how to do that. The best part of it uh, is that you have one of these guys, the CP Solvers team members, mentor you on how to do it. They literally walk you through it, meet with you, connect with you, and show you how to take your case and be more and more comfortable presenting it. So um, I really, really encourage you all to give it a shot. We learn uh, a lot from uh, everyone being here. All right, I've rambled enough. I'm really glad Parisa is doing teaching points because uh, the last case of acute leukemia I remember on VMR was hers. Uh, and I'll pass the mic to you, Parisa, to take us home. And thank you, such a great case. I, I learned a lot. Uh, I will point out some of the teaching points we learned today. Uh, we had a 71-year-old female who presented with ear pain and uh, right leg swelling. Uh, he eventually, we find out that he has uh, high white blood cell, and also he had uh, exertional dyspnea and dry cough. And we learned that when we have uh, we have multiple chief complaint, and when it is happening in three different locations, maybe they are not related, but we need to pay attention to the synchronous appearance of between the presentation. Uh, about her uh, dyspnea, we learned that dyspnea and cough has the, the we need to differentiate between uh, lung and heart failure, but usually in heart failure, the uh, lung are filled with fluid, and we also having the dyspnea even at rest. But when the problem is happening solely in the lung, we are usually having dyspnea and the exertion. And we learn how to approach cellulitis, and this, in cellulitis, usually we have more erythema than edema. Uh, and in DBT, we usually have the edema is more prominent in compared to the erythema. We learn about otitis, uh, which is otitis external is usually equivalent to cellulitis and the diabetes mellitus is a risk factor for that. And we learn about malignant otitis, which is necrotizing fasciitis, which is extending beyond the surface and sometimes to mastoid, which is happening here. Uh, we learn how to approach inflammation uh, with clot. Uh, we need to, we know that something systemic is happening uh, and uh, the the cancer is more likely in compared to autoimmune or infectious problem. We have a lymphocytosis in this patient and the approach to lymphocytosis is looking at the differentiation. And we need to consider the time course when it is something is happening acutely, which means the last CBC was normal. We need to consider leukemia, infection, CMV, EBV, and drug-induced hypersensitivity versus subacute and chronic, which is usually lymphoma, CLL, and T-cell involvement. We learned that sometimes uh, it is a technical problem that blast might be mistaken with activated lymphocytes. Uh, and uh, we learned that in this case, we have the infiltration of the monocyte and blast to the ear and lung, which was the reason for the initial presentation. These things is similar to uh, gum hyperplasia, which are, we are seeing in the AML. Thank you for this great case. Amazing recap. Thank you so much. I love that you emphasized the other quote unquote simple things that we talked about earlier, including the diagnosis of malignant otitis externa. Uh, but then, of course, your maybe your favorite topic uh, was your uh, professor in now of acute leukemia. 
All right, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we're really, really excited um, uh, to share the stage with you tomorrow for another RLR um, and hope to see you there. Bye.